Just what is that mortal wound that is healed? Of one of the heads of the beast has a mortal wound and is healed. This is part 91 of the Revelation study. We've been working through the book of Revelation. Right now we're in Revelation 13. We're looking at the beast, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the little horn, the king of the north. So we're looking at that right now. Uh, in a few videos now we'll look at the false prophet. But we, we've realized that we have to compare scripture with scripture. That's what spiritual is spiritual. Precept upon precept, line upon line. Here a little bit, there a little bit. And we remember the words of God. Oh, my people, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of all. Please consider subscribing to this channel. There's a little red button in the bottom right hand corner. And let's move on in the study. Okay, so the beast of Revelation 13, we've seen in the last two videos that it's for, the beast is continues for 42 months. A picture of the great tribulation. Satan gives him his power, his throne, and his authority. This, this beast has seven heads and ten horns. It's symbolic of the kingdom of Satan. It appears to be an individual because it has names through, in the rest of the Bible, like the Antichrist, that's a singular, the man of sin, the little horn, the king of the north. It appears that this will be the end time world leader to, of some type that will be in place. And we see the characteristics of a leopard, bear's feet, lion's mouth, we looked at that in the last video. I'll tag this slide with our series on this. So let's move on now and look at the important question about why is one of the heads receive a mortal wound and it's healed. Here is the key verse. I saw one of his heads, one of those seven heads, as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. Now we're going to look at the wonder and the worship of the beast in the next video, but for now we have to answer those key questions. What are these seven prophetic heads? Why only one of the seven heads is wounded to death? What does that mean? And what does the healing of the head mean? So we're going to look at that in the slides that follow, and let's move into that study right now. Okay, just a quick look at what other people believe about the mortal wound that was healed. Many believe it's a, simply a literal event. There's an antichrist, it's a person, it's a human that receives a mortal wound, but somehow miraculously recovers from either near death or being dead. Many people believe that. Others get closer to truth by noting that, no, it's just the restoration of the Roman Empire at the onset of the Great Tribulation. For example, the uh, reunification of the Europe, uh, Europe, and that's the ten horns that all come together. So there's other beliefs about this, but let's see what the Bible teaches about this mortal wound. Okay, so first it's important to see that there is a prophecy, one of the earliest prophecies in the Bible, Genesis 3.15, that talks about the head with a mortal wound. And it, it's it's got to be, because this is the, the only really strong parallel occurrence of this, it's important to fully understand this verse. Genesis 3.15, the Lord God said unto the serpent, this is after the fall of Adam, the sin in the Garden of Eden. And the Lord God said to the serpent, which is Satan, because you have done this, you are cursed. And I will put enmity, enmity or hatred between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your head. There's the mortal wound, the bruising of the head, and you shall bruise his heel. So we, we, so we need to understand what does it mean? Who is the woman's seed? Who is Satan's seed? And the seed's heel is bruised and the serpent's head is bruised. So we need to understand these things, and we're going to look at that in the next few slides. So let's move on and look at that. Okay, first, the woman's seed. This points to none other than Jesus Christ. We did a video, I'll tag the slide with this, uh, on the, the woman's seed, the woman of Revelation 12. Uh, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. And the woman represents God's people, and her seed is Christ, born as a, as a man. He's the man God. And the remnant keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The seed, though, is Jesus Christ, which we also see him referred to as a seed in Galatians 3.16, 2 
now to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made. He says not and to seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And we, if we are Christ, then we are also Abraham's seed. We're the remnant and heirs according to the promise. But Jesus Christ is the seed. Okay, so now Satan's seed. And there's a simple answer to this. We find in 1 John 3, all people are either in one of two categories. Either they're a child of the devil or they're a child of God. So let's read this passage, 1 John 3. He that commits sin is of the devil. For the devil sins from the beginning, from the Garden of Eden. And that again points back to the curse on the serpent. And it, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And the works of the devil are sin. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin or does not practice sin. For his seed remains in him. And that's pointing to Christ. And Christ dwells in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And he cannot sin, he cannot practice sin because he is born of God. We are the children of God. We're born of that seed. The seed is Christ. In this, the children of God are manifest in the children of the devil. Whoever does not righteousness is not of God, neither who loves his brother. You're either a child of the, the seed of Christ or you're a child of the devil. So Satan's seed is the kingdom of Satan. It's all his people. We see another passage, Matthew 13, 38. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, God's people. But the tares, or the bad seed, are the children of the wicked one. It's one or the other. So Satan's seed has to do with those who are part of Satan's kingdom. Okay, so let's now understand what Genesis 3.15 means by the seed, the seed of the woman, that his heel is bruised. And we find that the seed's heel was bruised at the cross. At the cross. As Isaiah 53. He, Christ, was wounded for our trans tra transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisements of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. He, he was the one that was bruised. He wasn't destroyed. He wasn't uh, uh, killed uh, spiritually or his soul didn't die. He was, his body was put to death at the cross. His heel was bruised and his body is that which walks on the earth. And walking involves the feet. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of, Lamb of God. Jesus heals. His feet is what contacted the earth. It's where he walked. He came as a man. He came as the God-man to suffer and be bruised for our iniquities. John 12, then Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet, the precious feet of Jesus were anointed, and wiped his feet with her hair. She worshipped his feet because that's, he came down and to walk on this earth for us, and to journey on here, and, and like one of, like as a human, the house was filled with the odor of the ointment, and Jesus said, let her alone against the day of my burying. Has she kept this? That's why his feet were anointed, because it's looking forward to the cross. It's looking forward to, to his death on the cross and his bur burying. That's why his feet were anointed. Hebrews 1.13, To which of the angels said at any time, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Thy footstool. It's what Jesus' feet are on. It's, it's things that are in subjection, but... This earth has bruised him. By coming to this earth, he received the, the chastisement of suffering in the flesh to, to provide salvation for his people. Okay, but now we come to the big question we have to answer for Revelation 13. We have to understand why is one of those heads of the beast, one of the seven heads, bruised? And how is it that this serpent's head is bruised? Okay, let's quickly review. There's four passages in the Bible with the seven heads and the ten horns. Revelation 12 and Revelation 17 point to Satan, because it's Satan's kingdom. The beast takes over Satan's kingdom, which is Revelation 13, which we're working on now. But when we go to Daniel 7, there's a little bit more detail about what these seven heads and ten horns mean. And we're going to look at that a little bit as we go, but we have to recall that the third beast had four heads, which was the Grecian Empire, and the, the, and the fourth beast had one head, but it had the ten horns, 
and that pointed to the Roman Empire. We have to recall that the seven heads and ten horns represent the perfection and completeness of uh, the purpose of king, the kingdom of uh, Satan's kingdom. So let's move on now and think about this a little bit more. Okay, so first let's understand the detail about these seven prophetic heads of Daniel 7. Daniel saw four great beasts come up out of the sea, diverse from one another, and this spans the whole time, the history, from when he was there with Babylon all the way to the end of the world. And there's four prophetic beasts. The first one is Babylon, which is one head. The second beast is the kingdom of Media Persia, which was a one head. The third beast was uh, Greece, which had four heads because there were four generals that came out of Alexander the Great. And then the, the fourth beast is the terrible beast, which has the ten horns, which is the Roman Empire. Roman Empire. So we see seven heads, ten horns. It's all the kingdom of Satan. These are the kingdoms of the world, the world empires, and they're going to take us all the way to the end of time. Uh, but we, and again, seven heads and ten horns. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so of these four heads, we need to understand which of the head was bruised at the cross. Christ's heel was bruised at the cross. So which of these heads was bruised at the time of the cross? And we have to note that the Roman Empire uh, has influence on the world today. B Medial Persia incorporated Babylon. Greece incorporated the previous two. The Roman Empire incorporated them all. And the Greco-Roman influence in culture, politics, science, law, art, architecture, etc. is all with us still today. So we have a total of seven heads. And to understand more clearly the head that we're talking about that was wounded, we need to look at Daniel 2. And we're going to do that right now. Okay, so we're going to move to Daniel 2. And Daniel 2 is an image. It's, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He's the king of Babylon. And he sees it, the image, this, in the image's head, this, this big idol, this image, the head was of fine gold, then the breast and the arms were of silver, the belly and thighs of brass, and then the legs of iron and feet, part of iron, part of clay. And that this points to, as it gets explained and interpreted by Daniel in Daniel 2, that the head is Babylon, the breast and the arms of silver are the media Persia kingdom, uh, it comes after Babylon. It actually destroyed Babylon and incorporated Babylon. Then the belly and thighs of brass was Greece, which incorporated Babylon, Media, and Persia as this kingdom kept growing. And then finally, the legs of iron represented the kingdom of Rome, the Roman Empire, which which became uh, encompassed all of these kingdoms. The feet, though, had ten toes, partly iron, partly clay, which is the end time kingdoms of this world it's satan's kingdom it's also represented by the ten horns of revelation 13 and revelation 17 but let's look on the next slide a little bit more at the, these ten toes okay so this fourth kingdom which is the roman empire is represented by legs and feet the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron and as an iron breaks all these shall it break in pieces and bruise those two legs are completely iron they broke in pieces. They, they were truly a, a large world empire, and they bruise. And we, we know that, they, that it was the Roman Empire that was in place at the time of the, uh, the cross. And then we see we bounce ahead to the end of time, whereas you saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom should be divided. And it's in those days of the feet and the toes that the, these kings, those ten toes, shall, and again they relate to the ten horns, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. It shall stand forever. This is the, the, when, the day when the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of God, and it's, it's eternity. It's the last day. So the two legs of the Roman Empire, but the end time ten toes, which are the ten horns, that's when we see that the, the kingdom come, and it's the last day, and its eternity is ushered in. Okay, so who actually crucified or bruised Jesus Christ's heel? Jesus Christ's heel was, was bruised at the cross. That's where he was crucified. So who did that? And it's easy to say, well, it was Pilate, it was the Roman soldiers. But So let's read the passage. Pilate sought to release him. 
But the Jews cried out saying, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Caesar's the, the head of the Roman Empire. And so in that regard, Caesar takes on the symbol of being like Satan. It's Satan's kingdom. He's the head of Satan's kingdom. Whosoever makes him a king speaks against Caesar or speaks against Satan's kingdom. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat. Pilate's hand was forced to crucify Christ and to deliver him up because, because the people are saying, well, he makes himself a king. He speaks against Caesar, who's representing Satan's kingdom. So Pilate's hand is forced. And he said to the Jews, behold your king. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. This is the chief priest. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest, who are supposedly the chief priests of God's people, the Jews, it's like God's church yelling out, crucify him, crucify him. And very unbelievably, they say, we have no king but Caesar. They're claiming, they're professing, they're confessing that Satan's kingdom is their king. They follow Satan's kingdom. So then delivered, Pilate had deliver, delivered him to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. So what happened here? Pilate represents the authority of Satan's kingdom. Caesar, of course, is the head of it. He's also a symbol for Satan. But Pilate represents the kingdom of Satan. But that kingdom of Satan is not only the Roman government. It's not only the Roman citizens. It includes the false Jews. It's both political and religious. Because those false Jews are saying, we have no king but Caesar. And we find that Satan... Satan was bruised, his head was crushed, his head was wounded as a result of the cross. We see in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, uh, 7 and 8, you made him, which refers to Jesus Christ, a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thy hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. It's the feet of Christ that bruised or wounded the, or crushed satan's head because we read a few verses later in hebrews 2 that it says for as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood he also himself took part of the same he came his feet touched down on this earth his feet were, were became dirty with this with the dirt of this earth he walked this earth like a man but he was god in the flesh that through death and the death at the cross that's the point of this victory it's the war in heaven it's the war that was fought. It's death. His death of the cross, he might destroy him that had power over death. That is the devil. Christ won at the cross. That's where his heel was bruised on the cross and Satan's head was, was wounded. And deliver those who through fear of death all their lifetime was subject to bondage. For he verily took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Christ is the seed, the woman's seed. He, his heel was bruised. But at the cross, he destroyed him who had the power of the death. That is the devil. And we know at the cross, very importantly, Satan was bound. He was the strong man in Matthew 12 and in Revelation 20. He was bound for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. And he was shut up. And there was a seal put on him. He was, his head was wounded. Salvation could now go forth. I'll tag this slide with two videos. One is on the binding of Satan. It's really important to understand that, that that's a defeat of Satan at the cross. The other one is war in heaven. Satan was defeated at the cross. There was a war that was, was conducted and he was defeated. Okay, so importantly though, we see that salvation comes as at the wounding of the head. And that's what happened at the cross. Psalm 68. He that is our God is the God of salvation. And unto God the Lord belong the, the exit from death. But God shall wound the head of the enemies. And that's what the strong man, Satan, the head was wounded at the cross. Habakkuk 3.13, you went forth for salvation of thy people, even for the salvation with thine anointed, which is Christ. You wound the head out of the house of the wicked. That head that was wounded was none other than Satan. But... We see that that wounded head is healed. It's because Satan is loose from his prison. It's the great tribulation. One of the heads was wounded to death, and we saw that, that it's Satan 
it was at the time of the cross it was the roman empire and those 10 toes are going to be in place during the great tribulation those 10 horns and the deadly wound is healed and all the world wondered after the beast the dragon has given him his power the dragon satan's been loose from his bottomless pit and he's given the beast the power the wounded head is healed it's those final 10 toes of that great statue of daniel 2. second thessalonians 2 the man of sin will be revealed that's the beast that's the antichrist the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or this worship. He's he's filled with Satan. He's filled with the dragon. So that he is God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he's God. He's right in the church. The church has become Babylon during the great tribulation. But finally we see that there's a final wounding of Satan. His head was wounded at the cross. He was put in the bottom, bottomless pit. He was released. But we see in Psalm 110, the Lord on thy right hand, which is none other than Jesus Christ, smote kings in the day of his anger. He does judge amongst the nations, has smitten the head over the mighty earth. And that's what the final bruise, the final wound of Satan. We see that also in Romans 16, 20, the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And we finally see in Revelation 19, behold, a white horse and he that sat upon him was faithful and true. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war, the final war, the battle of Armageddon. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. He has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Satan, the dragon, is joined with the beast and the false prophet in the lake of fire forever. Okay, so just a quick summary. The one head that was wounded to death, it's when Satan was defeated at the cross. Oh yeah, Pilate was the one that 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 put him and made the decision. But Pilate was a representation of the kingdom of Satan, and ultimately, that that the head of the kingdom of Satan is none other than Satan himself. It was the Roman Empire at the time, but it represented Satan. Jesus Christ was wounded; his heel was bruised for our sins. Satan's kingdom also included not only those in the Roman Empire, the Roman go government, but the false Jewish leaders, God's false people of the day that, that said they were following God, but they, they confessed that Caesar was indeed their king. They're the ones that crucified Christ, but that head is healed. Satan was released from the bottomless pit. That's the great tribulation. It's that wound that was healed, and it's just another indication of the great tribulation. So we're going to move on from now. We're going to keep looking at this beast. The wonder, he's got the world in wonder, and that's what he wants. He wants adulation, and he wants worship. The wonder and the worship of the beast, that's the next video. Please consider subscribing to this channel, and thank you very much for watching this video.